Welcome to the Lock Sportscast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news. This is episode 129, recorded December 20th, 2022. I'm your host, Charles Current. And in today's episode, UHS joins Automotive Keys Group, face recognition on your car, prove your door lock was hacked, the Three Tumblers podcast, community updates, videos to watch, blog posts to read, products, events, meetups, sales, giveaways, and more. You can subscribe to the audio version of the show on most podcast apps and at thelocksportscast.com. You can subscribe to the video version on YouTube, Odyssey, Rumble, or Apple Podcasts. Links to stories discussed will be in the show notes. Some apps limit the link to show notes and the ability to post links, but you can always find the full show notes with all of the links at thelocksportscast.com. First, your weekly reminder that we are coming up on Locky Awards season. So be sure to start thinking about what videos you might want to nominate this year for the Lockheed Awards. The categories will be the same as last year, so nothing new, new surprises there. And in actuality, I'm, uh, that's partly because of laziness. I am way behind on getting prepped for the Lockheed Awards because of my busy work schedule, but they will go on. It's just a matter of, uh, I'm not going to make too many changes, and there's, same as last year, there's really not going to be a prize. Just uh, bragging rights that you were a Lockheed Awards winner. So first up in the news, UHS joins Automotive Keys Group. I have to admit, I'm not actually sure of the significance of this, but it was sent in by uh, multiple people. So I thought I would uh, let you guys know for the locksmiths in the group that know what this means. They say, we are excited to announce that UHS has officially joined the Automotive Keys Group platform of companies. We will continue to operate independently for the foreseeable future but are thrilled to have the support and expanded resources available to help us continue to build our commitment to our customers and vendor partners. Be assured that you will continue to get the same great customer service from your sales representatives, fast shipping and competitive prices that you've come to expect from UHS. So for the locksmiths in the group, you can take that for what it's worth. I honestly have no opinion because I don't even know who that is. Next up is an article in Auto Evolution called 2023 Genesis GV60 gets world's first face recognition tech rendering keys useless. So obviously, the article is going to say that this is the world's first vehicle to use face recognition technology. And according to the article, setting this up is easy. All the users have to do is access the dedicated app and use a physical key once in order to set up their profile. Subsequently, the biometric data will allow them access inside with face recognition for the keyless entry and a fingerprint for starting. They say that this allows users to leave the digital and physical keys at home as their vehicle reads their face and automatically unlocks the door. An LED indicator is located in the B pillar and provides visual feedback on the status of the car. All data is encrypted, stored locally, and managed via the human machine interface. They also say that another novelty of the 2023 Genesis GV60 is the new digital key feature, which allows owners to lock and unlock their rides using their smartphone and or smartwatches. The digital key can be shared with up to three additional users, no matter how far away they are from the car, and they are able to set up various restrictions that restrict what that guest can do. Now, I actually, I have to say that I kind of like the idea of face recognition and fingerprint system replacing the wireless fobs. However, I think that just adding it on top of a physical key and digital key app just increases the attack options that a thief might have. But I think it could be really useful in not having a wireless fob that can be relay attacked or somehow intercepted and duplicated. It also means that you don't have to worry about losing your keys while you're out hiking, or if you're at the store and you lose your keys, you can still get in your car and drive away. So that is a big plus to the face recognition and fingerprint style system. That is, if the implementation is actually well done. Now, this next article is actually written in Danish, so I'm relying on accuracy of a translated version to come up with my summary. So there might be some details that I get wrong here, but 
The translated title was Hack of Digital Locks is Insurance Nightmare for Residents. There will be no coverage. The article is about hacking of digital locks and how it can be a nightmare for insurance companies and residents who may not be covered in the event of a break-in. According to the article, the hacking of digital locks has become more common in recent years, and it can be difficult for insurance companies to determine whether a break-in was the result of a hack or not. As a result, some insurance policies may not cover losses resulting from the hacking of digital locks, leaving residents who have had their locks hacked at the risk of being left without any coverage. The article also mentions some steps that residents can take to protect themselves from hacking, such as strong passwords and keeping their software and firmware up to date. It also advises residents to check with their insurance companies to ensure that their policies cover losses resulting from hacking of digital locks. And the article kind of raises the question in my mind, if there's no obvious evidence of forced entry, do the police even look for signs of lock picking or bumping or some sort of electronic hacking? Uh, Or do they just assume that the door was left unlocked? I know it would be to the insurance's benefit in this particular case to say that, oh, they left it unlocked and therefore we don't have to cover. But I don't know how the police handle that. I guess it probably depends on jurisdiction. So with that question, that also raises the question, are the statistics reported by the FBI and other agencies about the frequency of lockpicking, are those accurate? I know I seem to cover more and more stories about criminals with lockpicks. I don't know how many are actually using them. A few of them have been caught in the act, but most of them are just caught in possession, so I don't know how common it actually is. But they are starting to be carried more and more, and this makes me wonder how often they actually are reported properly. Moving on to community news, there was an announcement in the Lockpickers United Discord, an update on the Lockpickers United charity raffle. They said, hey all, just a reminder that the contribution window for the raffle ends a bit earlier this year to allow the organization process to be less hectic. Last day to submit new pots is December 24th. If you'd like to submit a pot, I need the following in a DM. Pot contents, country of origin, shipping range, and accepted cost. Extra details like pictures and such can come after the deadline since I understand that people might not have all the physical objects in hand or properly modified or organized by December 24th, but those things don't affect how the pots are fundamentally organized. For more information, you can go back to their earlier post about the. prize pot submissions but if you are planning on submitting a prize pot please get them the the required information the contents the country of origin and the shipping information by december 24th and we have a couple of quick congratulations first to se lock and key on hitting 12,000 subscribers that is a big milestone so congratulations to se lock and key and lock noob now with 250,000 subscribers. What a number to end the year on. So congratulations to Lock Noob. And we have a new podcast called The Three Tumblers Podcast. And it says, what is The Three Tumblers? Locksmiths talking about locksmith stuff. The podcast has three hosts, hence the name The Three Tumblers. Those hosts are Tim Coleman, Tyler J. Thomas, and Jeff Moss. It is hosted on Transistor.fm. If you follow the link in the show notes, you can find the page for the podcast with the links to subscribe to the RSS feed for that particular podcast. And I will also include a link in the show notes to uh, the first episode, which hosted on YouTube on Tyler J. Thomas's YouTube channel. Either way, whichever way you uh, prefer to consume your podcast content, you can find it in the show notes. And last week I mentioned the Abloy Classic Picking Simulator that was developed by Mao. Fungus. And right as I was posting that, Mao was posting a video on how to actually use the simulator for those who found the instructions uh, a little unclear. It's a very good instructional video on how the process of picking an Abloy and specifically on the simulator works. So I will put a link to that in the show notes for those of you who uh, 
might benefit from it. And I will also include another link to the Alboy simulator. I definitely recommend you check it out. And it was pointed out to me on Twitter that uh, Cranky Lockpicker has put out a new video after taking a few months off. The video is entitled, Hello Again, Update Ramble. The description says, Hello everybody, I'm back, well, almost. I wanted to say thank you to everybody who sent wishes and messages of support. This is an update video and mostly a ramble about where I have been and the things to come. Thank you to everybody who stayed with me and to Lady Locks and Chris Capoon for the shout outs while I was away. So well, welcome back to Cranky Lockpicker. He's also shared another video after this one, I believe. So be sure to stop by, check out the video and uh, pop into the comments and say welcome back to Cranky Lockpicker. And Anthony, aka Trill, found a whole a post on Mastodon that had a whole bunch of links to MS Rao on YouTube covering antique safe videos. Shared a whole bunch of them. Looks like a total of nine different video links. So I will, of course, have the links to those videos in the show notes, as well as uh, I'll just link directly to his tweet so that you can find the links there if you want. And the company that posts these videos also has one of these safes in stock. So I will post a link to that so you can check that out. It's only $98,500. But uh, that is for a safe that is from the end of the 18th or beginning of the 19th century. Beautiful safe. And I recommend you watch these videos because the way you have to open these safes is usually very intricate. It usually involves first locating the hidden keyways and then using the keys in a very specific order and manner kind of like a combination you got keys and you got to do this whole combination thing with keys and accessing keyholes and yeah very intricate each one is unique and uh, there's something something to behold so links to the videos of course in the show notes and clk supplies has a video up called my locksmith van was stolen in the video a locksmith in their area discusses his van being stolen from his home the theft was caught on video the video shows the thief driving the van to a location where they can empty out the contents. The locksmith also discusses the impact of the theft on his business as the van contained all of his tools and equipment. He also talks about the challenges of finding the stolen van and uh, replacing that equipment and the financial impact that it has had. So if you are a locksmith, it might be good to check this out get a, a dose of reality of what it would be like if your van was stolen and might make you think about uh, adding some extra security to your van and the way you store it. Moving on to blogs and articles here, we have two new blogs from Lock History. That's uh, Tyler J. Thomas's blog. The first is Rediscovering Corbin Ruswin Pin Segments. I'll just read one paragraph from the article that kind of summarizes basically the what the article is about it says the story of the development of the corbin ruswin cylinder manual is fascinating and i am fortunate enough to know one of the authors world-renowned master keying expert and 2017 philadelphia award recipient jerome v andrews cml there's a lot more in this article and i recommend you go check it out and while you're there Check out the post that was put up just today, as I'm recording this, the 20th, a brief history of the Mosler Safe Company, good in-depth history about Mosler Safe Company, its beginnings and its ends. So I recommend you go check that one out while you're there. Moving on to products. Red Team Tools has the key cutter guides for the leashy pliers for uh, Schlage keys back in stock. I don't know how long they will be in stock, but they are back. They were announced to be back in stock. Um, if you aren't familiar with what these are, these are 3D printed guides that attach to the front end of a pair of leashy key nipping pliers. With those, you can make calibrated cuts to your key blade at the manufacturer's proper bidding depths for Schlage systems. And those are currently $50 at redteamtools.com link in the show notes 
And Dark Arts Lockpicking announced on Twitter that they have an exclusive new DALP Discord server that is a subscription-based knowledge and information sharing platform. They say get bonus private member-only video chats and more, not to mention early access on products and video topics. That will be $5.50 a month for access to that server, if you're interested in that. Let's see here. And next is the Lockpick 101 Lockpicking Simulator for Android devices. This was originally found by Gaz on the UKLockSport.co.uk forum and sent to me by Tequila Dave. I am unable to try this one out as I don't currently have any Android devices. But if anybody has experience with this and they want to give a, anybody else some information, you can mention it in the comments of the YouTube video or send in a, a note to me and I will talk about it on another episode. Moving on to events and meetups, we have the exact same ones as last week. So if you want to skip through this real quick, that would be fine. We have Cactus Con in Mesa, Arizona, January 27th through the 28th. HCon in Madrid, February 24th through the 25th. Clacky Con in Durham, North Carolina, May 5th through the 7th. And Circle City Con in Indianapolis, June 23rd through the 25th. We have a couple of new belts this week. First, we have a brand new purple belt for Slim Pickings. So congratulations to you, Slim Pickings. And we had a brand new black belt announcement just uh, as I was preparing for this podcast. So it says, please join me in congratulating Jay Leaning as our newest black belt picker. Jay Leaning spent the majority of his time rising the ranks on the LPU Reddit and has just recently joined us on the Discord to continue his journey. For his black belt, Jay Leaning picked an Abloy Sentry, Dom Diamant, mentored multiple pickers on the Abus Plus, manipulated an SNG 6730, and completed the pick making discipline. So, congratulations to you, Jay Leaning, and congratulations, Slim Pickings, on your new belts. For anyone not already familiar with the Lock Pickers United belt system, there are links in the show notes to the rules pages and some videos that explain what the system is and why it's fun and beneficial for you. So be sure to check those out. And Panda Frog announced some new records on the speedlocks.org site. First up, we have the Kryptonite six pin padlock by Geoffrey McGarry in 18.307 seconds. The Fiche F3D exterior by 206 in 7 minutes, 9.767 seconds. The Dom IX Tweedo by Dependent Quartet 577 in 8 minutes, 44.167 seconds. West 917 by Dependent Quartet 577 in 18 minutes, 1.533 seconds. And the Wink House Titan by Squiggle Dork in 2 minutes, 16.069 seconds. So congratulations to all of you on those records. Now it's time to take a quick break, say thank you to the people that made this episode possible. I want to say a quick thank you to my newest patron, but unfortunately, I haven't confirmed the proper name to give them credit under yet. So if you are listening to this, please reply to my Patreon message so that I can properly work out what name to credit you under and we will get that fixed up in the next show thank you for becoming a new patron i really appreciate it so with that producers for this episode include uh first off the financial supporters we have medler panda frog michael gilchrist starlock williams brain dave to be deciphered lee bonds locksport journey pat from uncensored tactical three raccoons in a coat Cheryl, aka anthony dr hogmaster clayton howard aka cool tune Mog, John Lock, Rat Yoke, Mr. Picker, Cranky Lock Picker, JHP Picking, Bare Bones Lock Picking, Deadbolt Cafe, NWA Lock Picker, Snake, Paracentric, and my new patron. Chief content producer for this episode is Anthony, aka Cheryl again. Other content producers Bare Bones Lock Picking, Correct Jeans, Dark Arts Lock Picking, iFisk, Jeff Moss, Joshua Gonzalez, Oak City Locksport, Panda Frog, Sep Clues, Cisco Spaceman, Tequila Dave, the Lockpicker 1969 and Tony Varelli. Thank you to all of you who have sent in news or tagged me on posts so that I can see what's going on in the world. Really, really appreciate it. 
That is the only reason this podcast keeps going is because I don't have to spend my entire week trying to find the news. So with that in mind, please help me keep this show going by helping to support it the same way these people that I already mentioned have. Send in your news, links, events, giveaway information, anything you have that's Locksport related. That is the number one most important thing you can do to help keep this podcast going. I have to say that right now, Anthony, aka Terrell, provides about half of every podcast that's out there. And uh, I, Fisk, probably another quarter to a third of every podcast. So please uh, take a little of the load off and uh, give those guys a hand. You can send that information to any of the messages that are listed in the show notes. Easiest way is just to tag me on social media, be it on Twitter or Instagram, or send it, pop into my Discord and send it there. That's uh, pretty much all that Discord is good for at the moment. Uh, you can also email podcast at thelocksportscast.com. And if you're enjoying the podcast, don't forget to share it with your lockpicking friends. Leave a comment, thumbs up, review, whatever the platform you consume it on allows. Don't forget to subscribe to it on your favorite platform. If you want to help financially, you can. Definitely not required. Always appreciated, but not required. You can donate on PayPal. You can subscribe on Patreon or subscribe store. If you support the show with a donation or information I use in the show, I will give you credit in the show and in the show notes. If you have any interesting stories about things that have happened to you because you're in Locksport, because you're a locksmith, somewhere along your journey, something like that, feel free to send it in. I would love to share that on the show with the others. If you'd like to send me feedback, you can do that same contact methods I mentioned earlier or go to the locksportscast.contact. Uh, just remember, if you want it shared on the show, keep it reasonable length, polite, work family safe, no politics, no drama. And if you don't want it shared on the show, just let me know that. Moving on to our first criminal story. This one is a bit crazy. The article is entitled Army Veteran Shot While Confronting Suspected Thieves in Birmingham's Forest Park. And this Army veteran is also evidently a locksmith in the area. The article says that Army veteran Ethan Land was shot when he tried to stop what he believes was a car burglary in progress outside his Forest Park home. Just after 4.10 a.m., Ethan walked out of his home at the Windsor Apartments to go to his Jeep to go to work when he saw a group of possible thieves casing out cars. When he saw what was happening, he yelled, Hey! Within seconds, he was taking gunfire. He said, The very first pop I heard, I felt my shin get hit with something. He dropped to the ground, took cover behind a tree. He said eight more shots were fired at him while he was taking cover. The article also quotes his neighbor as saying, The gunman continued to fire on him even though he was wounded and taking cover. They didn't want to injure. Their aim was to kill someone for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. That is just a horrific story and has no place in our community. Land was able to make his way to a stairwell and got behind a bricked wall. He said the group of suspected thieves left a short time later. He was taken to the hospital. He said, I've got a shattered 45 caliber in my leg because the hospital was unable to safely remove all but two pieces. He currently can't put any weight on his leg and is expected to be out of work for an extended period of time while he recovers. He is a locksmith and the only representative for his company in the area. He says he is upset with the ongoing theft problem in his neighborhood. He believes that this is the same group of people carrying out crimes that have been taking place since last year. He said it's not the first time he's confronted possible thieves in the neighborhood, but said usually they just run off. He told the authors that he has reported this criminal activity in the area and turned over video evidence to police several times in the past, but there is no indication that anything has been done about it. His neighbor started a GoFundMe to help land with his medical bills and living expenses while he is recovering. He currently lives with his girlfriend and his service dog, Chewy. And so I will put links in the show notes to the story and the GoFundMe, just in case anybody is feeling generous this holiday season. Our second article says that uh, Weld County deputies arrest a woman with two bags filled with large amounts of meth and burglary tools. The article says that a wanted 35-year-old woman faces new felony drug charges after Weld deputies found 186.55 grams of methamphetamine in two of her bags. It says that on November 25th, a Weld County deputy 
responded to an agency assist call. Dispatch advised the Larimer County Sheriff's Office needed assistance with a stolen vehicle from their jurisdiction, a blue Ford excursion with Utah license plates. Larimer deputies reportedly GPS tracked the vehicle to a gas station in Weld County. As two Weld deputies began to make contact with the vehicle, a male suspect fled on foot, according to the arrest record. A woman carrying a blue tote bag and a small black purse exited the passenger seat and started to walk away. A deputy detained her and she agreed to speak with law enforcement. She advised the deputy of her name. He discovered she had an active felony arrest warrant. Her warrant stems from an arrest in March of 2022 on multiple drug felony charges, including possession of controlled substances, according to online court records. She posted her $1,000 bond a few days after that arrest. While deputies searched her black purse, they found large crystallized rocks and several small bags of similar crystallized powder, both consistent with methamphetamine, according to the arrest affidavit. The bag also contained items commonly associated with sale of narcotics, including unused small bags and a scale. Additionally, the blue tote bag contained a set of lock picks and various small hand tools consistent with burglary tools a small round orange container with crystallized white powder and a prescription bottle with her name on it. The crystallized substances found on her all tested positive for methamphetamine and the total weight was 186.55 grams. She admitted to possessing burglary tools, stated she received them from her former boyfriend. She also confessed that the meth inside the container belonged to her. Deputies booked her into the Weld County Jail on suspicion of her outstanding warrant two counts of possession of a controlled substance and possession of burglary tools. Moving on to sales. Hazardous Manufacturing is having a 25% off sale on their selection of slate coasters. No coupon code is required, they say. And uh, it looks like they have a few new designs. So you might want to check those out. Those are really cool looking coasters. Lockpickworld.com has a code GIFT22 for 20% off everything in the store. In a new site pointed out by uh, Anthony, aka Terrell, KSEC Labs, Red Team Tools and Hacker Hardware is having a 20% off sale until December 31st. Link in the show notes. I'm not sure how long it's good for, but right now the Dark Arts Lockpicking Dalp is back code appears to still be working for 15% off on their store. The South Ord Cosmetically Blemished Lockpick Tools and Accessories page is still up, but only with the two items on it still. Multipicks Christmas Sale still running. That page is still active. Link in the show notes. Peterson has their code for 50% off their bump hammers, and that code is in the show notes. Bare Bones Lockpicking. 10% off store-wide with the code BONES10. If you want some law lock tools equipment, you can either get that from Bare Bones Lockpicking with that discount code, or you can use the link provided by Re Review Guru on Twitter for 10% off a minimum purchase of 50 pounds at Law Lock Tools. You can get 10% off at 3DLockSport.com with the code LSCAST10. 15% off at Mako Locks with the code by Mako. 10% off uklockpickers.co.uk with the code GIFT. Moving on to giveaways. Very short list. Looks like most of the ones I had have had their giveaway draws already completed. We have a new one here from the Lockpicker 1969, the Big Lockpicker Holiday Giveaway for December 17th, 2022. He says there's going to be a total of seven winners and runners up, and those will be drawn on December 23rd. Third, if you want to know the rules, check the link and watch the video. CLK Supplies weekly hashtag Lockboss giveaway. Lots of good prizes that they give. So be sure to check that out and get entered while you're watching that video that I mentioned earlier. The locksmith, the one about the stolen locksmith van. And that brings us to the end of another show. Thank you to everyone who listens. We're coming up on the end of the year should end the year with 130 total episodes 
which means I've only missed a few in the last two and a half years that we've had the show going. Really appreciate everyone's help in making that possible. It would not be possible without your support, without all the news sent in by the contributors. So please help them out and send some in if you can. And remember to keep it legal. (laughs) 